Ecological niches describe an organism's role in the ecosystem, including its interactions with other organisms as well as the environment. In this video, we'll explore the key concepts of ecological niches and some of the ways organisms can be classified by how they interact with each other and other species. We'll also explore the differences between fundamental and realized niches and how competition affects the niches of populations. We'll look at how organisms break down carbon compounds for energy and how they can be classified by their use or avoidance of oxygen. We'll also see that organisms can be classified by how they obtain carbon compounds from processes like chemosynthesis or photosynthesis. We'll look at how organisms have different adaptations for survival to both aid and avoid predation and herbivory. Finally, we'll explore some of the adaptations plants have to compete with other plants for access to sunlight. These are some of the most important topics covered in the IB biology syllabus. An ecological niche is defined as the exact role and position a species has in its environment, including its interactions with other organisms and the abiotic environment. This includes their habitat, or where they live, along with the behaviors they may have for mating, feeding, sleeping, and waking patterns, as well as interactions with other species. When we consider the interactions organisms have with other organisms in the environment, we can refer to these as biotic factors. These kinds of interactions can vary, but they can be categorized as interspecific relationships, from predator-prey interactions to herbivory or interspecific competition. We could also be discussing interspecific relationships that are symbiotic relationships like mutualism, parasitism, or pathogenicity. An organism's niche is also determined by its tolerance to abiotic factors, like the range of temperatures and humidity the species can survive in, as well as the access to water they require or soil composition for plants. No two species occupy the same niche as their genetic differences ensure that one species is more adapted to a variety of biotic and abiotic factors than another species. We can explore this concept when considering fundamental and realized niches. Let's consider barnacles as a case study to explore the concept of fundamental and realized niches. Barnacles live in the intertidal zone on rocky shorelines, attaching at different heights depending on their tolerance to exposure of environmental conditions, such as exposure to air, heat, and sun. They are filter feeders, feeding when submerged by extending appendages to capture plankton. Their niche includes adaptations like resisting desiccation during low tide and withstanding wave action through strong attachment. Ecologically, they compete with other sessile species like mussels and serve as prey for predators such as sea stars, fish, and whelks. A species' fundamental niche describes the full range of environmental conditions a species could theoretically occupy without considering competition and predation. While a realized niche is the portion of the fundamental niche that it occupies due to limiting factors such as competition and predation. For example, if two species are grown together in different conditions, like these barnacles here, we can see that their populations will both be reduced where their niches overlap. Pause the video and use the data table showing the relative populations of yellow and brown barnacle species in varying conditions to determine which species is better adapted to cooler, low light conditions, and which is better adapted to warmer, more sunlit conditions. If we take a look at the coolest temperature and the lower light conditions, we see that there is almost 100% of the barnacles present in those conditions are from the brown species. As the sunlight and temperatures increase, the brown population decreases. So the species of barnacle in dark brown is better adapted to cooler, less humid conditions, while the species of barnacle in light yellow is better adapted to warmer, more humid conditions. However, their niches overlap where we see both species present in these intermediate temperatures and humidities. In warmer, more humid conditions, the yellow barnacle outcompetes the brown barnacle and vice versa. Competitive exclusion states that no two species can occupy the same ecological niche indefinitely. If two species have the same exact needs from the environment, 
but different adaptations to the environment, which they must have because they have genetic differences, then one must be more adapted than the other species and will eventually outcompete them. What we more often see are overlapping niches, as we see in this example. The way a species obtains nutrients and energy is also a part of its niche, and we'll find there is a wide range of modes of nutrition for different organisms. When considering how organisms harness energy and obtain nutrients, one classification is based on how they release energy from carbon compounds, either with or without oxygen. Some organisms require oxygen to metabolize carbon compounds and release energy, while others cannot survive in oxygen-rich environments. Let's begin with the term obligate. To be obligated means that something must be done. The term aerobe refers to an organism that requires oxygen to grow, survive, and function. So an obligate aerobe is an organism that must have oxygen to survive and grow. Humans are obligate aerobes. We require oxygen to break down carbon compounds like glucose through aerobic cellular respiration. Although we can temporarily survive through anaerobic respiration or fermentation when oxygen is scarce, this is only suitable for a short period. Microorganisms can also be obligate aerobes. An example is myobacterium tuberculosis, the bacteria that causes TB. The prefix A means without, so obligate anaerobes are organisms that cannot survive in oxygen-rich environments. Instead, they rely on anaerobic respiration processes like fermentation to release energy from carbon compounds. All obligate anaerobes are microorganisms, either bacteria, archaea, or some fungi that can be either single or multicellular. An example includes methanogenic archaea, which thrive in oxygen-poor environments like peat bogs and produce methane. The term faculatative describes organisms that can survive with or without oxygen, depending on the circumstances. Faculatative anaerobes, like the bacterium E. coli, can switch between aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Some E. coli strains aid human digestion and live in the low oxygen environment of our intestines. Because they can also survive in oxygen-rich environments, they're widely used in lab experiments. While most strains are harmless, some are pathogenic, and you may hear about occasional outbreaks caused by the harmful E. coli. We've discussed how organisms release energy from carbon compounds with or without oxygen. Now let's examine how organisms obtain these carbon compounds. Organisms can be classified by how they obtain energy-rich carbon compounds that they break down to release energy. The two major categories are autotrophs and heterotrophs. Autotrophs obtain carbon from inorganic carbon sources like carbon dioxide, which they convert or fix into larger organic molecules like glucose. Photoautotrophs use light energy to convert carbon dioxide into glucose or other carbon compounds. This includes plants, algae, and single-celled eukaryotic organisms like chlorella, which perform photosynthesis in chloroplasts using the pigment chlorophyll. Cyanobacteria, which are bacterial prokaryotes, so no chloroplasts, will use chlorophyll or other pigments for photosynthesis, giving them a bluish-green color. Some archaea, which perform anoxic photosynthesis, produce ATP but do not generate oxygen or glucose in the process. Chemoautotrophs also fix carbon dioxide, but instead of light, they use the energy from chemical reactions. These are all prokaryotes, such as iron oxidizing bacteria in lava beds, who harvest electrons from iron to generate ATP. Methanogenic archaea, which produce methane by combining hydrogen and carbon dioxide to generate ATP. These live in oxygen-poor environments like peat bogs, animal digestive tracts, and the deep ocean floor, where they can produce methane bubbles under the seabed. Heterotrophs obtain energy-rich carbon compounds by consuming other organisms or their organic byproducts. They can be further classified based on how they digest and absorb nutrients. Holozoic nutrition involves ingestion or taking food into the organism, then digestion 
or breaking down large carbon compounds into monomers, for example, starch into glucose, followed by absorption or transporting monomers across membranes into the organism, after which assimilation occurs or using those monomers to build new polymers, for example, using amino acids to build proteins. Finally, egestion is expelling undigested materials as waste. Animals use holozoic nutrition. HL students may also study endo and exocytosis in single-celled organisms like amoebas, which is another example of holozoic nutrition. Saprotrophic nutrition is external or extracellular digestion. Saprotrophs, like some bacteria and fungi, secrete enzymes outside their bodies or cells to break down carbon compounds. Once broken down into monomers, these are absorbed. For example, a mushroom growing on a forest floor digests leaf litter externally and absorbs the nutrients into its tissues where it's assimilated. All saprotrophs are decomposers, but not all decomposers are saprotrophs. For example, an earthworm is a decomposer, but uses holozoic nutrition. Some organisms combine multiple nutritional strategies. Mixotrophs use both autotrophic and heterotrophic modes of nutrition. Euglena, a single-celled eukaryote, can photosynthesize and consume other organisms. They are faculative mixotrophs, switching modes depending on available resources. Some oceanic plankton are obligate mixotrophs, meaning they must both photosynthesize and consume organic matter to grow and reproduce. These are important primary producers in marine ecosystems. Some mixotrophs don't generate their own chloroplasts. For example, corals host zooxanthellae algae in symbiotic relationship, relying on the algae's photosynthesis for carbon compounds, but also consuming plankton. Other protists steal chloroplasts from algae they consume without digesting them. This is called kleptochloroplasty. These organisms become mixotrophs by temporarily retaining functional chloroplasts from their prey. Predators are organisms that hunt, kill, and consume other organisms, which are referred to as prey for food. Both predators and prey have adaptations developed through natural selection to enhance hunting efficiency and survival. Predators possess traits that enable them to detect and capture prey, such as improved vision. Binocular vision, characterized by eyes in the front of the head, provides better depth perception aiding in capturing prey despite a narrower field of view. They may also have sharp claws or teeth that assist in killing prey once captured. Additionally, predators typically exhibit stalking behavior and high speed to pursue prey effectively. Prey have various adaptations that help them to avoid predation. Their eyes are generally located on the sides of their heads, providing a broad field of vision adapted to detect quick movements, alerting them to approaching predators, although this reduces depth perception. Protective features like camouflage reduces detection by predators, while physical defenses such as shells, spikes, or poisons deter and endanger predation attempts. Poisonous species often develop bright coloration to warn predators of their toxic nature. Other prey species may exhibit mimicry by displaying similar markings to poisonous species despite lacking actual toxicity. Herbivory involves a plant and a heterotroph that consumes it, similar to predatory relationships. Plants have adaptations to avoid herbivory, such as thorns, spines, or nettles, to deter herbivores from consuming them. Dandelion plants have several defense mechanisms, including milky, toxic, bitter compounds in the leaves and flowers, some plants, for example, milkweed and nightshade, have highly toxic compounds which cause sickness or death in herbivores. Additionally, certain plants release chemical compounds that attract the predators of their herbivores. For example, corn can emit chemicals to attract wasps that kill worms from feeding on their leaves. Herbivores have adaptations for herbivory, including piercing mouth parts that allow them to penetrate plant cell walls to access the phloem and extract sap. Some organisms have developed poison resistance and the ability to metabolize the toxic compounds they consume. 
For instance, milkweed produces a toxic compound, but monarch caterpillars have adapted to digest it. Plants evolve not only to defend themselves from herbivores, but also to compete with other plants for resources. In tropical forests where water competition is minimal, the primary resource plants compete for is sunlight, leading to many different adaptive strategies. One strategy involves plants adapted to shade that grow on the forest floor and have broad leaves and dark pigments to capture more light. Other strategies include fast and tall growth to penetrate the tree canopy, requiring strong wood stems for support. Other plants, like lianas, are climbing vines that utilize the support structure of other trees to reach sunlight. Some epiphytes, such as orchids, grow in the branches of trees, improving their access to sunlight but limiting their access to soil. Thus, their aerial roots require minimum soil. Strangler epiphytes grow on tree branches but also develop long stems to access the soil. They can overshadow their host's tree leaves and eventually kill it, allowing them greater access to soil resources without competition from the host. 